So today we are going to be talking about the Nazino Tragedy, which is also known as Death Island or the Cannibal Island, which is a known small labor camp island during the USSR that went terribly wrong. Um, as most things that Stalin do go terribly wrong. Um, so in short, sort of to sum, sum things up, too long, didn't read. Um, this was a program put together by the USSR in order to send a ton of deportees to an area that wasn't really populated um, in, in like Siberia and then till all that land, get a bunch of people farming and thus ha use that as labor camps and also use that to make food and farm food for the Soviet Union that was currently going through a famine at the time. But I will get into specifics as we continue. Kulaks. Had to look up how to pronounce Kulaks for a second, because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to say that in a way that would not be correct, as I probably will most words and names in here. I am learning Russian, as in I am just barely learning the alphabet, but you know, baby steps. That's, how, that's, that's what it takes. So to start, we should explain where this kind of, what, what was going on at the time that, that started this program. So the year was 1929, and there was unrest within the Soviet Union, as there usually was. But what was going on is that the Kulak people, which like, for, for a definition, is basically someone who's considered a peasant, but is wealthy enough to either be able to farm or to like have their own farm and animals and stuff like that. So those people um, were being uh, like forced to sell all of their crops and their harvest for like dirt money to the to the government to the Soviet Union um, just because they had to because they you know they were forced to so in response to that what they were doing is they were instead of farming they just wouldn't farm they would kill all of their animals they'd break their tools destroy their equipment anything to not be able to provide for the Soviet Union and obviously this was an issue Stalin didn't like this so Stalin deemed the Kuliks basically an enemy of the state um, and anybody who stood up against him, he considered an enemy, you know, go and report him, that kind of stuff. In February of that year, a man named Genrich Yagoda. Genrich Yagoda, I can pronounce that right, um, who is the head of the OGPU, which I found out also stands for the Joint State Political Directorate, which was the, the secret police of the time, Stalin's, like, special forces. Um, and another man named Matvey Berman. Matvey Berman. Um, again, please forgive me if I am butchering these words. Who was head of the Gulag system that was going on, and they they put their thick skulls together um, and came up with an idea to propose to Stalin. And this idea was based on what I said previously, where in the past it had semi-successfully worked, where small groups of um, kulaks and like agri agricultural farmers and stuff were brought to rural areas to farm the land and make. So, th so that has worked successfully in the past, like successfully. Um, so they were like, hey, let's do that again, but let's do it with specifically like a very, very rural part of um, Serbia. And let's use that as these people's punishment for going against what we say. Um, so we'll send them there, that'll be their labor camp, that'll be their punishment, but we'll also have a bunch of farmers making food for us, so that'll fix the famine. So that was kind of their goal with the whole thing. So to be specific, they wanted to, like, over time, send roughly two million people into Serbia and, Serbia and Kazakhstan to let that happen, and hopefully they would be self-sufficient in two years, and again would help stop the famine that's going on. However, unlike the previous attempts, um, their supply was like incredibly low. They did not have enough supplies to do this. Um, reasonably, it should have never been approved. But the and I'm looking at my notes, so please forgive me. Uh, the Council of People Com the Count the Council of the People's Commissars of the USSR approved this, and they started going through with with production or production as far as you can say. So with the proposed uh, resettlement plan approved. Um, they went forward with it, and the original target audience was going... Target audience? Are you kidding me? The original people who were going to be arrested um, were the kulaks and agricultural farmers and stuff like that. That's the, that's the people that they wanted because those are the people with the most experience. However, due to a... And this is going to be a hard word for me to pronounce. 
passportization campaign. Most of the people ended up being urban civilians. Um, so what essentially was happening was the Soviet Union was like, hey, um, in order to get a passport to essentially be like given the rights of a citizen in, in main major cities, you had to have a direct impact or direct influence in either like production <clears throat> or like a government job. So if you didn't do any of those, you weren't granted a passport and thus could be arrested for not having one, which can be an issue when it comes to some things. So it ended up going essentially haywire for most of these people. This was also in conjunction with a attempt to cleanse major cities like Moscow um, from undesirables. So as well as people who didn't have a direct impact in like government or, or um, industrial jobs, if you were like suspected to be speaking against communism or against Stalin in any way, um, a lot of criminals were, were lumped into this mix, so mainly just if they didn't really like you, they were attempting to cleanse these areas. So these people were sent to be deportees when they weren't really supposed to. Um, however, that's ended up that ended up being what was the main like issue with all of this. So between March and July of 1933, uh, 85,937 people living in Moscow were arrested uh, and deported, deported due to specifically lack of passports, and then 4,776 people living in Leningrad were um, deported for that same thing. So the original plan by um, the, the two guys who proposed this, uh, Yagoda and Berman, those are their last names, um, was to have all of these deportees kind of go through a bunch of transit camps before they got to like the original or the um yeah original place that they wanted them to be um and those camps hadn't been built yet so the the camps in tosk which i'm going to check really quick and see if that's how you pronounce it tomsk so um Tomsk being one of the first ones and one of the largest, um, hadn't been like rebuilt yet. So they started from the ground up, they were going to rebuild and hold a total of 15,000 deportees. That was going to be the max that this thing could even have. Yet in April, 25,000 deportees arrived, which was already over their max, and it was already like a month before this thing was even supposed to be finished building. So it's not done yet. So 25,000 deportees show up, and they have no idea what to do with them. And nobody could bring them any further because they were, like, ice was blocking the river that was stopping the, the ships and, and or trains and stuff from going further and dropping these people off. So the first people that showed up were the Colex and were the agricultural people um, who were good at farming and stuff like that. But since there's already uh, more than anyone ever bargained for, um, the Tomsk like uh, security or at least authorities panicked and they, they described these people as already starving and unclean and contagious were their words. There is a report from Vasily Arsenievich Velichko. Vasily Arsenievich Velchko. Um, and he was the head of the local communist party in that area and he was he was like overseeing all of this. Um, and this is like a direct quote from from him, and I'm going to read that right now. It is hard to tell how many, even who, died, because declared documents had been confiscated at the time of arrest, or by police organs at the detention centers, or on the train by criminals who used them to smoke. However, some of them, some of them brought their documents with them. Party and party candidate cards, Komsomol cards, passports, certificates from factories, factory passes, etc. And then he goes on to describe two people. Novozlov, uh, from Moscow, Compressor Works, Driver, awarded bonuses three times, wife and child in Moscow. After work, he was getting ready to go to the cinema with his wife. While she was getting dressed, he stepped out to smoke a cigarette and was apprehended. The second woman. Gosevna, an old woman. She lives in Maram. Her husband is an old communist chief officer of the Maram railway station who has worked there for 23 years. Her son works there as an apprentice engine driver. Guseva came to Moscow to buy a suit for her husband and some white bread. Her documents did not help her. So this man is basically saying how these people were pulled off the streets and there's nothing that they could really do. They were arguably not doing anything wrong except the... Soviet Union and Stalin had labeled them as criminals. 
So to recap, in April is when those 25,000 deportees arrived in Tomsk. And now in May, May 10th, all of the people from Moscow and all of the people from Leningrad arrived as well. So they were swarmed. Daily rations were incredibly low. Um, they were 10 ounces of bread per person, and we can't even guarantee that everyone got their rations every day, as I would imagine many people didn't. So the authorities at this time, with the uh, river having melted, they were like, okay, fine, these these people are from the city. A lot of them contained, like, from, from Moscow and, and Leninburg, there were criminals that were put on there to simply, like, decongest the prisons in the area. So they decided to send them to a place that was 500 miles away from Tonsk in western Siberia, which was only inhabited, inhabited by a few indigenous Ostag people. Um, and that is the island that we will come to know. So with that, on the 14th of May, um, four barges that were originally made to transport like cargo, like pull pull logs and limber or uh, logs and timber and stuff down down river, um, those were filled up with about 5,000 deportees. Again, their their rations were lowered. Half of them were criminals. The authorities that were put on charge were completely inexperienced. They were brand new. They didn't even have uniforms yet, and they are transporting these people. Uh, to an island in which they are going to attempt to play the ultimate game of survival and see how long they can last and let alone try to get these people to be self-sufficient in two years, which is impossible at this point. It's already breaking down. On the afternoon, on the afternoon, on the afternoon, uh, why did I, why do I say that? <laughs> on the afternoon of the 18th of May, there we go. Um, the barges arrived on arrived on Mizino Island. Um, there isn't an official roster, like an official writing down, of how many people got on or off. But from eyewitness account and from like what is written down in people's like journals and stuff, not like an official ledger, it says that there were 322 women, 4,556 men, and 27 bodies of those who died during the trip. Um, but that's what was offloaded from these barges. Um, and it says that one third of the people were too weak to stand upon arrival. So simply arriving, they finally made it to the destination in which is going to be the hardest part of all of this. And one third of these people are already starving and exhausted and are too weak to stand. On the 27th, um, the additional like 1,200 um, deportees arrived on the island as well. Um, those were from uh, a mix of the Kulak and the people from the inner cities arrived. Um, along with all of this, there was about 20 tons of flour, which is like nine pounds per person that was brought. And that was the only form of like food or utensils or two, that's it. Just 20, 20 tons of flour to, to feed these people for like two years. Um, and obviously that didn't work out. So when, Initially, the authorities, which was only a few people, um, started to distribute the flour. Fights immediately broke out because these people are already starving. So they decided to simply not distribute the flour. Um, and they waited four days, four entire days. They just held it and didn't do anything with it. So they then moved the flour to the other side of the island, which at this point, if I haven't described, is two miles long and like 650 yards. So it's a, like a very th long but uh, thin island. So they decided to move it to the other side of the long part and then try to redistribute the flour again. Didn't work. Fights broke out. Uh, shots were fired. So they were like, all right, we're going to once again not give you flour. And they did that for a couple more days until they eventually came together and decided that they can break people up into groups of like 150 in their own like brigade things. And each group can have a leader in which that leader will distribute the flour for the groups. They're, they're, that way there isn't like a massive amount of flour that people are trying to get. However, with there being literal convicted criminals, not just people who like didn't have their passport type criminals, um, they often abused their power and became the leaders of these groups and then would hoard the flour and not give it to people, which obviously caused uh, a much bigger issue, but since the guards were like, oh, hands off, we gave you the flower, we don't know what to do with it, that's your own fault, sorry, uh, and they didn't really do anything. They had their own rations that they kept, they kept for themselves, which they kept separate from everybody else on the island, so they basically said like, nope, you're good, if you want to deal with it, you got to talk to Shiv Jim over there, I'm sure he'll be nice to you and give you some flour. <laughs> 
So even even with all of this, even if you if you did have flour, if everybody had their rations, there's no way to cook this. There's no way to make bread. Um, there is nothing to cook on, nothing to cook with. So what people ended up doing is mixing the flour with the very unclean and unsanitary river water, or like pools of water that were on the island, and uh, like everyone got dysentery. Um, that was spread violently throughout the entire group so that already started to kill people so people are exhausted starved uh like they have no shelter there's n i forgot to mention that there's nothing on this island they there was supposed to be things built so things are currently being built in um tomsk and then they are 500 miles away so everything in between here has to be built first before they even get here so they're out in the elements and it snowed like the first day and it was incredibly cold and it's also a swampy place so if you've never lived anywhere that is swampy and can kind of get cold it's a really not good situation you can, because things are both very very moist and also very cold which leads to freezing so you're most likely going to lose like fingers and like frostbite is far more prevalent in in those areas some people started to form like rafts like put stuff together get on the river uh none of them worked um a lot of the times what would happen is it would collapse and then hundreds of bodies would wash up onto the shore because they overpiled the rafts in fear of wanting to get off the island and if they did somehow make it from the rafts to elsewhere the guards would just kill them um the guards were known to find escapees and hunt them for sport they they remarked personally that uh they found it fun to because there's there's no they're the only law out there at this point so it's it's really showing the development of the darkness of man to where completely unregulated they just hunt people so shortly after everyone arrived on this island, word from Stalin came that he didn't approve this going on, despite the two men proposing it to Stalin, and they got approved by a small kind of court council underneath Stalin, which so they, they ran with it assuming that Stalin would approve it, and then he didn't. So that's when all pandemonium broke loose. It was already an incredibly chaotic, but top that on the fact that they're now like, okay, this is a sinking ship, we're out all amount of funding, all amount of supplies that may have may have been shipped there is now not going to happen. Nobody's going to come over to come over here to build anything. So even the hope of a possible win is drowned out at this point. So very few, if any, basically none of these people uh, knew how to make the land hospitable anyways. They didn't know how to build anything, they didn't know how to farm, so gangs quickly formed and murder became rampant. It was, um, you were murdered for food, you were murdered for fun, you were murdered if you had uh, anything valuable on the, on you, they would loot your bodies and like sell the, sell those goods to the guards for more rations or for food or sell them amongst each other for food or kill each other for food. It was uh, very not good to say the least. And uh, on top of that, the guards sort of developed a tyrannical rule over everyone. Because as I said, you're on like the edge of the world, uh, nobody else is around, no one's going to tell you no. So these guards took it upon themselves to be like the high, the high ups. They determined what was going on. So the people on this trip who were not guards, like, like there was a few doctors on this trip, uh, feared for their own lives because now they realize no one's coming to get us. And the guards have gone full corrupt, all of these people are starving and, and are going crazy, and that's when the doctors realized that they saw their first signs of cannibalism. So on the 21st, it is documented that out of 70 new deaths that happened on that day, five of them showed signs of cannibalism. So showed like bite marks, there was suspicious like missing flesh in which you know, that might lead to it, you know, the, the doctors were starting to assume, okay, these people are getting desperate to the point that they've started to nibble on their dead, which isn't good. And over the next month, these guards arrested 50 people who were charged with cannibalism. And again, the arresting doesn't really mean anything. It, it's most likely assumed they either killed them or just punished them even harsher than the others. Um, and it could entirely be up to, these people couldn't have been like, there was certainly cannibalism on the island, like, that's completely undeniable, but as for the numbers of what these doctors are writing down, 
and knowing that the tyrannical rule of the guards, I, I don't doubt that there was maybe someone who didn't commit cannibalism that was killed or harmed because they were like charged with it or, or thought to have done it. Of the statements given out by survivors and, and by witnesses, there was a woman who a, man, who a woman who managed to escape and she was taken in by, by like the peoples who were closest by and they found she had a bunch of bandages on her legs and when they unwrapped it, her calves were carved off. Um, of which she reported was cannibalism. So that was one of the first outside mentions of people getting word that cannibalism and really bad stuff is going down on this island. There was another case of a woman who was found by a guard tied up to a tree and most of her flesh had been cut off or removed. She was still alive. This guard tried to save her but couldn't for obvious blood loss. Um, but the, these were... This was when things were at a point of no return. Um, people had already committed cannibalism, were now regularly doing it, and this was, to be fair, their only form of food or, or sustenance at all. I am not, I wanna put a big, big disclaimer. I don't support cannibalism in any way, shape, or form. Just saying that, put that on a t-shirt. Um, but I'm simply saying, I don't think these people were doing it out of maliciousness, they were doing it out of a form of survival. That's all. Actually, I might I might rescind that slightly. I do think there were some people who were doing it out of maliciousness because it seems that there were criminals that were pretty uh, pretty horrific that seemed to be getting enjoyment out of it. So that's all I have to say about that. So quite quickly in early June, um, this settlement was disbanded. Word had reached uh, Stalin and the hires up and and word had reached that hey it's chaos there is an island full of cannibals out here and that's your fault so obviously troops were sent to collect all of the people that were still alive on the island there was a total of 2856 people who were removed from uh, the island and transferred to again sort of back towards uh, civilization on on these original labor camps that were put there they were just kind of like peppered through there to spread them out however 157 couldn't be removed for health reasons which could be anything I assume it could be because they had an illness or there were plenty of people on this island that were simply slowly dying so I wouldn't doubt that they left the people who couldn't really be saved which is very dark but I, I assume that that's what that means for health reasons. So a official report on these incidences, which was issued by uh, Velchilo, which is, I definitely pronounced that wrong, but um, which is one of the, the higher ups of like Tomsk. So this is his official report on the incident. 6,114 outdated elements, which means undesirable people, uh, arrived on the island in May of 1933, and at least 27 died during transport. It snowed the first night, and no food was distributed for four days. On the first day, 295 people were buried. So that's that man's statement about the about the first events that happened. Um, when people from Nizino Island uh, were brought to other camps, it was found that out of uh, 2,000 survivors only 200 to maybe 300 were even fit for work in the first place. And this was sort of, sort of the end of the island. It was abandoned at that point. Um, as for the guards, they, they, some, some got jail sentences, but it was in regular jail for only a small amount of time. But Nazino Island definitely wasn't the last or the first of these types of islands. However, it, it was one of the most talked about because of the cannibalism and the atrocities that were found there. So this, this put an end to the large scale resettlement uh, camps that the USSR was doing. They still made some, and it was still awful, but there is nothing at this scale that we know of um, for, for reasons of which I will detail. But this, uh, this also made a permanent end to these camps having those who were not educated on how to farm or how to stay alive in very uh, rural scenarios because it quickly degrades and goes a little bit crazy much faster than the other camps would. 
So, f as an example, uh, a small statistic here, in 1933 alone, in the USSR, there was 367 to 457 known untraceable special risk sediments. So, 367 to 457 different attempts at doing this resettlement thing that were untraceable, of which, of all of those, it was marked that uh, 151,601 people were like taken back out of those and put back into society. Meanwhile, uh, 215,856 were deemed as disappeared. Assumedly they died or could have been another situation like this and we just don't know. Um, the one reason that we know about this island is thankfully due to the Humans right, Human Rights Group Memorial um, and they worked really, really hard to get these documents declassified in 1988, which is when... So the public didn't know about any of this. The only reason that they knew about it was of witnesses, of tales of what had happened, but nothing was officially, like, documented on paper or released to the public until this group was able to get it released in 1988. Hey guys, this is Editing Me. Um, upon looking to find the image for this group, um, I found out that actually in December they were shut down or at least have been attempted to shut down uh, by Russia because Russia claims that they are labeling the USSR as a terrorist state by reporting what actually happened. And I just want to make it known that this is the reason why things like this are important is because history will be erased by people who don't want things to be seen, and the only reason we know about this is because of this group. So if you can do anything to help them out or, you know, do your own research and just make sure that when you're looking into things that you understand that there are a lot of horrors of history that we don't know about to this day, and we may never know, but hopefully with enough time and dedication from good people like this, um, we'll be able to figure it out. Anyways, uh, back to the video. So. That's about the, the quick and short of, of the story. I know I didn't really do it justice, um, but it's just a, a small example of something, something that happened that was interesting enough and it caught the public's eye and people worked very hard to get this brought to the public eye. Um, and it makes you think about how many things are not in the public eye. How many of those almost 500 cases and 215 plus thousand people that are gone and deemed disappeared. Obviously a lot happened when Stalin was in rule and I'll, I'll happily go into those later um, because that man was a monster beyond monsters. Um, but this is just one case that we know of and, and there are a few, there's always interest around when cannibals are brought up because it's usually the darkest point in man. Like that's, that's usually the point that any human will know that they've gone too far when you could you revert to cannibalism out of not like it's different from if there's like an uncontacted tribe that that has committed cannibalism as part of their like quote unquote culture and as compared to someone who is so desperate and so starved that they revert to cannibalism it, it's Excuse me. It's something that interests a lot of people because a lot of people can barely understand or or even fathom how one could get to that point. So I just wanted to talk about this because I've only seen like one or two videos on it, um, and I've only seen one or two people talking about it. So uh, I hope you enjoyed. I know it was <laughs> I know it was a dark one. Um, when I say enjoyed, I mean I hope you like found it interesting. Um, this is my first video, so. I will happily make more. Um, I'm currently in the very small corner of my studio apartment, uh, so hopefully this isn't picking up the sounds of the city outside and the sounds of the uh, apartment on that side. Um, but yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Um, if you liked it or if you didn't like it, please leave a like or dislike. I know that they removed the dislike button, but I can still see it. Um, so I'll know if you didn't like this. Um, if you have any constructive criticism or anything you want me to cover next, uh, please leave it in the comments. I would, I would happily take suggestions on what to do. 
I, I love when it comes to mystery, mystery and history, uh, all of those mixed together or, or just random things. If you want me to cover the creation of paper cups, I guess I could do that. That would be interesting. Um, but I hope you all have a good day. Um, and I hope you have a, a, a good rest of the week. Uh, and that's about it. All right. Bye friends. <laughs>